Good afternoon, everybody. Um, so today we're here to inaugurate the uh, seminar series for the Ideas Center. Ideas stands for Informed Democracy and Social Cybersecurity. Um, this is the new center that started at Carnegie Mellon that is uh, partially underwritten by the Knight Foundation. Today, what you're going to hear is several things. First, you're going to hear about what is social cybersecurity. You're going to hear about what the National Academy of Sciences thinks is important to do research in this area. You're going to hear a little bit about the kind of research that um, my group has been doing in this area. And you're going to hear about what we're interested in doing in ideas and give some idea and also give some information on how you can be a part of that. So a lot to cover. Hopefully we'll get through it all. So social cybersecurity is basically a new emerging scientific field. It is a computational social science field that brings together people from every single science you can imagine, practically, to look at how can we, uh, how can we talk to each other in social media, through the internet, et cetera, without being unduly influenced. So it's both the science for characterizing, understanding, et cetera, cyber-mediated changes in the space, as well as the engineering to develop new technologies, new tools for helping us progress and maintain that as a free and open space for democratic exchange. Um, in common terms, it's often fun to think of it in contrast to cybersecurity, which is often viewed as how do we hack computers and hack databases, where social cybersecurity is about the human. It's how do you hack individuals and groups. And so that's the big difference. The people of social in this area, the National Academies, I'm now going to talk about what they have to say, uh, developed what was called the first ever uh, decadal survey. That means a 10-year survey of the social sciences for the intelligence community. This particular decadal survey focused on all of the social sciences. Normally, this is like, what should NASA be doing in the next 10 years? So this is very broad. And they looked at all the different areas and tried to come up with what were important directions. One of them they came up with was social cybersecurity. And so it has its own, own chapter. The report is out. And I can send you pointers if you haven't seen it already. But the report begins by saying there's a lot of stuff we can already do and don't necessarily need more investment in. So for example, we can already identify topic groups and measure echo chamberness. We can already identify topics. We can do cross-media linkages. There's tools out for doing that. There's a lot of things also that are under development that will be ready to be used commercially by governments, et cetera, in very shorter, like next couple of years. So things like fact-checking sites. There's an increasing number of fact-checking sites around the world, not just in the US. There's stuff for doing deduplication of images. There's stuff for sentiment mining. It's terrible, but it exists, OK? There's a lot of stuff for image modification. Uh, and so on. So there's lots and lots of stuff that is out there and that is coming out. Importantly, these capabilities do two things. One is they help find stuff that is actually infringing on people's ability to exchange information. The second thing they're doing is developing technologies that infringe on, <laughs> infringe on you. So there's both technologies for creating, uh, for example, deep fakes, as well as now people are starting to find new ways of trying to find them. Within the social cybersecurity area, some of the areas that were identified, there are basically the following uh, seven. One is social cyber forensics, which is actually utilizing forensic science, but applied to things like social media, phishing attacks, and so on, to figure out who's doing what, basically. Identification of maneuvers, a maneuver in socials in this area is um, something that you do in your, in, your, in your messaging. It's a type of messaging that is trying to achieve a particular effect. Like a message such as uh, that's trying to create excitement in those who read it. Then there's intent identification, like what are people trying to do with those messages. Uh, information diffusion in general and the diffusion of disinformation, misinformation as well. In fact, there's an entire DART program looking at that. Measuring the effectiveness of an attack. So if someone, uh, so like 
measuring the effectiveness of, say, a Russian influence campaign on the Canadian elections would be an example. Uh, identifying who is most success susceptible to attacks. Interestingly, a lot of the research now is starting to show that susceptible or vulnerable populations are often women, underrepresented minorities in, a, in any country, pick your favorite country, uh, and people with alternative lifestyles. And those are often the vulnerable populations that are often most attacked by these kind of things. Uh, and finally, how do you mitigate the attacks um, and you know, make communities, again, more resilient? Within that, they came with, with a number of research directions. And these research directions, they go into a lot of depth in the, in the report, but basically they include such things as supporting the design of counter-messaging strategies. Everybody says, oh, we've got to counter things. How do you do it? Well, nobody knows for the most part. Okay, so the question is, how can we design those? And how can we do that with it, without violating and um, our ethics, our morals, and our guidelines, so that the ways that we change things and counter things, you know, don't make the situation even worse. Uh, other things would be uh, developing methods for measuring the impact of information campaigns, both short and long term. You're going, well, can't you already do that? The answer is no. If you look at the huge number of tools out there that actually measure messaging in, in the internet and in social media, most of it uses what are called vanity metrics. How many times was I retweeted? How many people liked my image? Okay, With, and that's not really impact. What's really looking at, it, at impact are things like, did this increase polarization in the community? Okay, did this, was this creating mass hysteria? Was this causing, you know, a group to become more violent? And that's when they talk about measuring impact, what they're concerned with. So those are some of the research directions in the area. So now I'm going to switch a little bit and saying, look, this is, the National Academy has recognized this is an important area. There's lots of research in this area that needs to be done. It is widely recognized that this research has to go beyond the traditional sciences and that no one single science has the answers. This is not just a behavioral decision theory problem. This is not just a psychology problem. This is not just a computer science problem. So it's kind of, can we build this together transdisciplinary? I'm now going to give you some examples of the kinds of things that are going on based on the research that I and a bunch of my students have been doing. And so everything that you'll see in the next few slides is actually coming from a lot of research by a lot of people, some of whom are in the room, um, looking at different kinds of influence campaigns in social media. Now, <clears throat> when people talk about influence in social media, one of the things a lot of people think about are the stories that are being told. That is, what is it that people are saying and how can you use things like bots or whatever to shape those stories and change them? And so a lot of it has been focused on the narrative. What can, how can I make topics trend and so on? In point of fact, our research has shown that that's only a part of what's going on. A lot of the stuff here is actually affecting and changing who is talking to whom? Not just what they're talking about, but literally creating groups, changing groups, and changing who is important in them. It's literally changing the social network, the networks. A lot of people don't even realize that, you're, that it's possible to do that. They just think you talk to whoever you want. In point of fact, a lot of influence campaigns are literally changing it. And they're doing it by tricking the various uh, social media platforms into prioritizing who gets to talk to whom. Um, through controlling communities and controlling their conversations, you can actually then influence groups and change the way they behave. And we have actually seen instances of them changing the ways they behave in terms of inciting more violence, inciting protests, altering voting behavior, and so on. So again, this is not purely technical, it's not narrative, it's this kind of control process spread throughout. A lot of the work in this field centers around disinformation. Some of the work that Matt and I and others have been doing has actually shown that it, disinformation is very confusing because it's not one thing. It's not like there's fake news and then there's everything else. It's, there's many, many, many things that go under the name disinformation. 
um, ranging from things that are very obviously not uh, not true, such as um, factually inaccurate you know statements, to things that are well they're kind of not true but not really that are more innuendo and misleading and flights of logic. In general, this kind of disinformation tends to be either simple or hard to identify based on current technology. The harder it is to identify, the more the more likely someone in Washington will call it a deep fake, not just talking heads, okay? Uh, it also are things that are unambiguously not true. They're definitely not true stuff. To things that are they're kind of true, so they're more ambiguously not true. So this guy is kind of the space of disinformation, lots of different cases. We've seen instances of all of these kinds of disinformation in natural disasters, in responses to elections, in uh, campaigns in social media for health-related concerns. Okay, so they're all over the place and they range in how strong or how weak they are. Here's some examples of some of them. For example, uh, one of the typical ones that's very easy to identify and always occurs are the megastorms. Another one is the sharks in the water. Every time there's a natural disaster that involves high winds, someone puts up a megastorm picture, which is swirling clouds, over whatever the favorite monument is of the city. It's been over the Empire State Building, it's been over the Pittsburgh Towers, it's been over, you know, the Eiffel Tower, you pick, you pick it. In contrast, there's the stories about the White Helmets. Now, the White Helmets is a relief group that goes through the Middle East and other places uh, and basically rescues people from terror attacks. But there's a lot of stories out there claiming that they're actually terrorists. Now, where did this come from? One of the ways this came from is from a video that was made that shows members of the White Helmets rescuing people from an attack, but it's not really an attack. And the people who are being rescued are really other members of the White Helmets. They're just pretending to be sick and lying very still. This movie was actually made by members of the White Helmets as an entry into something called the Mannequin Challenge. It was never posted officially, but it is used as some of the evidence that they're not who they claim to be. Are they or aren't they? The jury's out. Okay, so this is an example of when it becomes more and more and more ambiguous. Another one that's a little bit sitting closer to home is the disinformation campaigns around surrounding anti-vaxxing. In social media, the classic disinformation statements around anti-vaxxing are statements like, my girlfriend did not get her kids vaccinated and they don't have autism. Absolutely true, absolutely irrelevant. You could never find that with fact checking. Disinformation is extremely hard in part because of these very ambiguous kind of things that are hard to identify and show. <clears throat> Here's an example put together by Dave with respect to Triton Juncture, which was a NATO campaign. Now this is a Russian campaign. Now, there really aren't diapers out there with soldiers on them, okay? However, you know, this is an example of a campaign where what they're trying to do is imply through something that's not true that in case, this case the forces are weak. And you can actually see lots of different lines of campaigns focused around Russia is strong, focused around the uh, European Union, you know, NATO and the U.S. in general are weak, focused around polarization and societies like America, Sweden, etc. they've done, and focused around isolation of Israel. All of these kinds of dis campaigns include different kinds of disinformation. They're then carried forward by other individuals who think they're absolutely true, in which case we call it misinformation because they don't know that it's not true, and so on. But this can be very crazy. You'll notice I've used only pictures up there to show them and illustrate them partly because pictures are cool, but partly because images, videos, memes are becoming very, very important in the spread of, this, of disinformation. <clears throat> so how do people respond? Well, because there's so many different types of disinformation, uh, there have to be multiple layers of response. So part of it is to try to prevent things before they're ever created, like convince people to 
not spread false things. Part of it is responding to specific incidents by calling it out, uh, providing satire and various other things that people have tried. Part of it is by getting those communities who are going to be more likely to be attacked through disinformation and helping them become more resilient recognize when they're under attack and respond to it. So things through things like uh, um, online critical thinking and so on. So part of the issues in this area is that there's not going to be a single solution. It's going to be spread out through many, many different kinds of things. We're gonna to have to bring all this together. One of the things we've been focusing on are influence campaigns and how to characterize them, analyze them, study them, how to measure them and so on. And for that, we've created this thing called the BEND framework. Now, BEND is, we'll talk a little bit more in a minute, it's literally just the initials of the information maneuvers, okay? But the overall framework looks at who is doing something, okay, what exactly are they doing in terms of these maneuvers, who are they doing it to, and what is the impact? So on each of these is a line of research. Identifying who, you often can't really tell that it's, you know, this was done by Corey. You often can't tell that. But what you can tell was, was this done by a bot or a cyborg? Does this appear to be coming out of Russia or coming out of China? So you can look at things in terms of characteristics and kind of the demographics of who are doing things. Secondly, you can look at what they're doing. And here we're talking about maneuvers, like are they affecting the narrative? Are they affecting the social networks? Uh, how are they doing it? Are they making it more positive, more negative, and so on? And how fast are they doing it? To whom is, are, they, are they, these maneuvers aimed at individuals or groups? Are they trying to make someone look more important than they are? Are they building groups together? You know, what is the target? And then finally, in terms of impact, we have a line of research trying to develop new measures such as are, are this maneuver increasing the echo chamberness of the group? Is it increasing the degree of polarization? Is it increasing the degree of hysteria? So new measures that actually get at some of these more insightful types of impacts than just, oh, I've been retweeted 50,000 times. The tools that support this are all over the map. And some of the common tools that people talk about here are things like bots, and if you don't know what a bot is, it's just simply a piece of software that can go out and send most messages and post messages for you, okay? Some of, sometimes they're perfectly legal, other times they're not. It depends what they're doing. Cyborgs are part bot, part human. So this will be something look like a bot most of the time, but every now and then a human comes in and tweaks the messages. Trolls are usually humans hiding behind fake personas and that usually engage in disruptive action through doing things like using abusive language or using passive aggressive styles um, to get people to do various things. So if you look in a lot of the online health groups, there's usually uh, trolls in those trying to convince people that they really don't, don't need this self-help nonsense and they should go off and do other things. Okay. Um, there's also memes. Memes are basically images with words across them. They're often used for uh, carrying political debate. You've also got all the new videos and images. So YouTube is just up there as an example of where you would get videos. You also have these things called cues. Cues are subconscious indicators that occur in, your, that occur in posts that actually give uh, insight into what the emotional state of the individual is. There's some, so this is like your use of things like first person pronouns, uh, your use of expletives, your use of exclamation marks, the length of your sentences, the reading complexity, and so on. And getting at that is often a way of getting at emotional state. And people use these cues also intentionally in the way they write to excite a particular level of emotional state in the person reading it because there's some unknown relationships there. And of course then there's the deep fakes which include both the uh, talking head videos, you know, pre making an image seem like it's making it look like it's Obama talking when it's really someone else as well as the other kind of deep fakes which just means deep storylines that are so ingrained and so hard to find that you can't really figure out where it's coming from and it takes excessive resources to discover. So these tools and things have been used to support information campaigns. 
Now, if I was going to talk to NATO, which I just did, when people there and talk about the information campaigns, they talk about the four Ds. The four Ds actually came out of studies of what is Russia doing to the rest of the world. And the four Ds include dismiss, distort, dismay, and distract tactics which are ways of spreading messages to try to get the other side to think about the world differently. And each of these kinds of um, maneuvers have been well understood. The Atlantic Council has an important paper on these. And you can actually go through and see these kind of maneuvers being used in every information, every influence operation, et cetera, you know, in, in that has occurred in throughout the world in the past few years. Okay, these are very classic ones. This is all great, except for one thing. Many, many information maneuvers look nothing like this. And that's because you can often win more people by spreading honey than by spreading, you know, things, but then by making them sad. So a lot of information maneuvers are actually more positive and make people change their minds by doing that. And that's because what's manipulatable is not just the narrative, which is where you would be affecting the, the distort, the dismay, et cetera, but it's also affecting the community, changing who is talking to whom. So we have the four Ds are out there looking at the narrative, but then we also have other kinds of maneuvers in the other space. So to understand information maneuvers I'm going to be describing and see why they make sense, it's important to understand that in social media, and I don't care if you're looking at Reddit or Twitter or Facebook or whatever, is organized into these things that we call topic groups. So the picture up on top is kind of like a notional picture of what this is like. Think of it as a bunch of little groups. They come and go, and the groups can be big or small. They change sizes. They're very event-driven. And as new events occur, but each one of them has the characteristic that they're filled with people or entities talking to each other, more or less talking to each other, more or less about the same thing. So you might have a topic group that is focused around the Dallas cheerleaders. You have another fo topic group that's focused around what did tr Trump tweet last night. You know, there's another fo topic group out there that's focused around the World Cup. So there's lots of these things, and they come and go. We always say in organization theory that restaurants are the E. coli of organization theory because they come and go so fast. In this uh, area, topic groups are the E. coli. But topic groups can take on a pathological form, and that is they can become an echo chamber. An echo chamber is nothing more than a topic group where the connections among the individuals have gotten so densely interconnected that's not more or less talking to each other. It's like they are definitely only talking to each other. And they're exactly talking about the same thing. So it's a very pathological form. It's very hard to maintain a group in that form for a long time period. But they can go into it, and then they can go out of it. And so as you excite groups and so on, they can sometimes enter into this kind of pathological form. And then, then as they get unexcited, then they will slightly slip out of it. For you as an individual, if you're in one of these groups, it's hard. You know, for you, it takes a lot of strain and stress on you to stay emotionally excited enough to maintain your presence in an echo chamber for a long, long time. So social media, again, is about these networks. The echo chamber form I've shown you up on the top there, all connected to all. And then you have the super spreaders, which are the individuals who have a disproportionate ability to get their message out where people have heard it. That doesn't mean they believe it. It just means they, they've got it. And then you have the super friends, which are the individuals who are engaged in two-way discussion back and forth. What we found is that um, the individuals who are acting as super spreaders are really good, like I said, for getting messages out there. But the super friends when the two-way things are actually much better for changing people's opinion and getting people to act in certain ways. The important thing about super friends is that if it's a group of actors, all of whom are super friends with each other, you've got an echo chamber. So you have to be very careful to not overconnect in that sense. <coughs> when these things work in these topic groups, the way the different um, maneuvers work is by exploiting the technology, exploiting our own brains again, and exploiting our brains against us. 
What they exploit in the technology are the things that, the, the features in the technology that control who sees what, when do they see it, how often do they see it, and so on. So they, they exploit things like the prioritization algorithms, the scroll down technology, because most people are lazy and don't scroll to the end, they only scroll past the first four or five things, okay, and they'll look at, at that. On the cognitive side, the maneuvers are designed to exploit basic biases we have, such as confirmation bias and uh, various things having to do with uh, intimidation and escalation of commitment. But one thing that is not well studied is how these maneuvers are used to actually exploit our social cognition. Now, our social cognition are the heuristics that we as human beings use to make sense of vast quantities of data in terms of groups. So it's the grouping functions. Okay, it will include such things as your reliance and discussion about the generalized other. So when you hear people say, well, everybody knows, they're talking about this generalized other. It's an idea from anthropology. Uh, stereotyping features and inference type features. And well, all of these campaigns are actually designed to create the appearance of a generalized other that you can point to to say everybody knows or to exploit stereotyping behavior. So they're really designed around a lot of these kinds of social cognitive biases. Let's look at how those play out in echo chambers. Now again, remember the echo chamber is this pathological form. And what we found about echo chambers is that not only do they have this high connectivity, it's on two dimensions at once. It's I talk to you and we talk about the same things. In organizations, you can show that if you want to change an organization's behavior, you have to change who is talking to whom and what they're talking about at the same time. In an echo chamber, if you're creating an echo chamber, you're doing that. You're stylizing it into a particular form. Once you have an echo chamber, what happens is that the group tends to lose objectivity. People start sharing information more as anecdotes or as stories rather than as facts. Uh, their linguistic skills appear to go down. The length of words, the complexity of the words they use actually goes down. Uh, they become suspicious or even hostile to outsiders. And information moves extremely rapidly in it. So that if one person finds out a piece of information, everybody gets it. And topic groups that become these kinds of echo chambers, again, tend to be event driven. But they also have the feature that they tend to be primarily single language based. This does not mean there's no social media posts out there that are multilingual, but within a topic group, they tend to concentrate on a single language at a time. So you may have multiple topic groups on the same topic, and then they'll each be in a different language. Once you're in an echo chamber, the emotions can get riled up quickly. If you rile up qu the emotions quickly, people go into what's being called amygdala hijack. What happens is that they're riling up your emotions and you start responding to things uh, emotionally rather than rationally. So building up echo chambers and building up the emotions go, puts people into this amygdala hijack mode. And when they're in this mode and they're only responding emotionally to things, you can actually get people to make really dumb decisions. Okay. And one of the things that's critical about these groups is the groups that are echo chamber-like, that are able to survive longer and that have more involvement of people are those that have offline analogs. Because those individuals are not only talking together online, they have an offline group where they're also talking offline. And in those cases, the emotion transfer goes from online behavior to offline behavior. And when you see cases of it, and that is where you actually get people starting to get involved in protests and violent behaviors. <clears throat> so going back to BEND, BEND are a set of information maneuvers. Uh, the four Ds are part of them, but it also includes four positive ones uh, for affecting the narrative four for affecting the uh, who's talking to whom positively and four negatively. Bots and trolls basically work on, to inform this. These can be used in general on the narrative. They can be used on the individuals and in creating topic groups. So BEM stands for, again, the four Bs, which are the positive community building techniques, like building, backing, boosting, and bridging. 
uh, the four E's, which are narrative positive things like ex creating excitement, enhancing, engaging, explaining. The four N's, which are the negative uh, community things, such as uh, nuking groups, neutralizing them, neglecting them, and narrowing them. And the four D's, which are the dismiss, distort, dismay, and distract techniques. All of these maneuvers now we have seen over and over and over again in a lot of different campaigns. So here's more detail on what those things mean. I'm not going to go into detail on every single one of them, but each one of these, okay, has a specific way of acting. Let me show you one that uh, David found in some work that he was doing. Again, this is from Trident Juncture. They were both done with images. On your left is an, a campaign that was an Excite campaign, trying to create happiness, joy, uh, cheer among people. Uh, NATO decided to post these things out about the Viking warrior, and it got a lot of things. It was like, oh, cute young guy, virile, yo, yay, we're doing good. In contrast to that, Russia puts out this meme here, which shows, you know, here's, you know, military might of Russia versus the military might of Europe, with a lot of connotations about, oh, well, they're women, they're weak, they're not military, we're, you know, we're man, we're military. That was a, would be a dismay campaign. Now, in this particular case, you could say Russia won the war of ideas because you'll notice they had a lot more impact in terms of who was and the frequency with which and the number of stories that came off of it. <clears throat> this is an example of an enhance and a, dismay, a, a dismiss campaign. Dismiss you often do by belittling thing. Here it's done with a meme, you know, basically saying that, you know, Syrians are being attacked. Well, we have to help them by attacking them too. Okay. In contrast, the one on the left is actually a, a positive or enhanced campaign uh, that is actually done by Russia looking at uh, Israel and basically making the argument that uh, Russia, that um, Israeli's iron de uh, dome air defense is, going, is a failure, Russia's is not, and here's why. Now, in reality, not only is this an enhanced campaign, it also is an explained campaign because it tells you here's why and explains why. And it's also for those if you're if you're Israel or their allies, it's a dismay campaign because it says you know Israel's not doing well. The point here is that with these bend maneuvers, we can actually begin to identify more complex uh, campaigns in terms of sequences of these things that co-occur. As I mentioned, it's not all about just narrative, it's also about talk, or it's also about uh, creating linkages among individuals and changing the network structures of things. And so there we can talk about different kinds of behaviors. Here is one that was done, a uh, former Sumai Matt Benigni did on the left, which is a bridging campaign, or building campaign. Uh, what this one did is there was no group. Literally, there was no group. And, but there were just guys out there, young guys in the Ukraine, who were sending out pornographic pictures of women. The bots then were used to actually co-mention two different guys. So like, let's say Jack and Joe were sending messages. This then said, J mention Jack, mention Joe in the same message, and then would have an image. So now, what that meant is that Twitter then started telling Jack and Joe about each other's posts. And before long, all of these young guys knew about each other. And before long, they were all, you know, sending pictures back and forth to each other, and they were all following each other, and so on. At which point, after they built this community, they switched over what was happening with the bots, and they then used them to actually tell them these guys where to go and get guns and how to get involved in the fight for over Crimea. On the right is a new campaign. This is one Dave found. This is a Twitter geofence. This is actually um, a person uh, spitting out Finnish numbers, okay, completely covering over the land there. And the point about this new campaign is that if you've got a group under there, like people in Finland uh, trying to send out messages, all of a sudden they can't, no one, it's going to be much, much harder for people to find them because it's going to be so obscured by this particular campaign. This is a back a neutralization campaign that was hiding as a backing campaign, again found by Dave. Uh, this particular one, Yona Craig is a um, she's a journalist, okay, and she's just out there reporting on uh, what's going on in Yemen. And all of a sudden, her number of followers just skyrocket right through the roof. 
And a lot of them have these ugly pornographic images or were sock puppets like you see there. And, the, and what was happening was there were all these bots being added to her to the point where it was difficult for her to counter them because there were so many coming on so fast. If she were to counter them all, she wouldn't have had time to set out the nose. So that's what we would call a neutralization one, but it's hiding as though it were a backing one. Be careful who follows you. This is our most egregious one to date. This was actually one that was done by ISIS. Um, this is the Fear Be Known bot. The Fear Be Known bot is a perfect echo chamber. The Fear Be Known bot is mentioning each other. It's mentioning people in there. And what it did was it started to build the bot, followed each other, which now meant Twitter would start paying attention to it because it always pays attention to topic groups. And the type, more of an echo chamber they are, the more they pay attention. It then started following the imam, who is a super spreader. Twitter also pays attention to super spreaders. And anyone who retweets the super spreader, their messages will get prioritized, particularly if they're a group. So that group's messages were now being uh, prioritized to all the other members of the group. Once that happened, people started to follow, because it was now recommended also that they follow it. They started following the bot. At that point, the bot started tweeting about the site, which is believed by some to be a money laundering site for ISIS, taking money for the children of Syria. Okay, whole complex thing. Or in other words, this is a build, build back bridge dismay and back campaign. But the one that drives most people crazy is the, is the polarization campaign. This is a classic polarization campaign occurring in US elections, Swedish elections, uh, many other elections. This is one that was not an election base. This was just when uh, Russia, uh, this is just what Russia did to Germany. Germany posted messages saying, yay, we're going to take part in three different NATO events. It was kind of wave the flag. It was a nice, excite campaign. And people in NATO put this out and they were looking at it saying, oh, we, yeah, lots of people are retweeting this. They're re-messaging us. They're re-redditing it. They're posting it all over. We won. We have a good message. Well, it wasn't really being resent by the Allies. It was being resent by Russia. Russia was the one who was retweeting it. So vanity metrics don't work. In contrast to that, there was another message that came out that basically said Germany won't really have the capability here because NATO costs too much. That was sent by Russia. That's a dismay campaign. That was then resent more and more and more by other Russian sites. Uh, and then was reset again by the Allies. So what they did was they created these two groups that became, they basically infiltrated two groups, that pro-NATO and the anti-NATO, infiltrated them, sent messages out to create more dismay on one side, more excitement on the other, and caused increasing polarization and, uh, to the point where there were even protests. This kind of campaign works because you have excite and dismay, which excite the amygdala, get people excited emotionally. Okay, so they get hijacked. It also works because you've got the boosting and backing campaigns on the networks themselves going on, which makes the groups more and more and more echo chamber-like. So you've got these two things going on at once, making it more of an echo chamber and exciting emotionally, and that leads to the polarization. <clears throat> we also see uh, that different groups are coordinated differently. This is from Amman. Uh, in this case here, what you're seeing is the uh, deniers uh, of climate change are more organized. They tend to have uh, they tend to have more echo chambers. They tend to have larger cliques, larger clusters, and fewer. Sort, and the bots are used very differently, whereas the believers are all over the map. We see the same thing with other conservative groups uh, as being more organized and coordinated, and bots being used differently. So the structure matters, the organization of these things. We also see these things playing out differently with respect to uh, the kind of um, how, who is actually doing the support for things. So this is in the Philippines. It's not a Russian story. It's a Chinese story. But what's happening here is the Chinese are buying up uh, services to send out messages and they're doing things in support of those candidates who are in support of stuff that is uh, in China's interests. Okay, and they're actually doing things to make those groups supporting the candidates that support China's interests to be more echo chamber-like, to be more happy, and trying to increase dismay in the groups that are anti that by their messages. And they do this through positive messaging. China likes to use a lot of positive messaging. 
So a lot of it, this kind of influence, bend maneuvers let you do that. So I've told you a lot about the R work, but let's go back to ideas. So in ideas, what we're trying to do here in this new center is to do work not just like this, although this would be part of it, but also to work on all the things I didn't talk about. Like how can we create games to help train people to um, not fall for disinformation? Or how can we train people to think critical thinking, to engage in critical thinking at scale? Or how can we help groups become more resilient uh, to various kinds of disinformation? So basically, our overarching goal is to enhance the is to enhance this area to preserve and support an informed democracy. We're really trying to look at this from a perspective where you know the challenge is there's disinformation, there's hate speech, there's all these things going on, but we need to remain informed. So we can't just you know kill off the internet, we can't just kill off social media. How do we do it? That's really where we're coming from. And we're coming at this from a full university perspective, building on every department, every college, and so on. We have a research mission, uh, which will help build new transdisciplinary sciences in this area. We have a development mission to build socio-technical solutions, so people will be building stuff, but not everybody. Uh, an education, looking at new courses here, more outreach to the world at large, to journalists, policy makers, et cetera, and engagement of the local community as well. Why do we think CMU should be doing this? Because basically, if you look at all the research in this area, and there's thousands of people working in social cybersecurity, this is the co-authorship networks, and basically what you find is that the core of the co-authorship networks is Carnegie Mellon. Okay, the work here is actually central. We're more connected to more of the people and so on. Already we've been approached by three of the other night centers to help coordinate linkages between the, uh, the, new, ten, the new ten night centers. Our overall approach is to, to look at this very comprehensively. We're not trying to focus in just on better bot hunters, but we're trying to take an end-to-end -end approach, going from characterizing attempted manipulations to understanding uh, the motivations behind attacks to forecasting behavior to preventing and countering to uh, diverting and inoculating people. Okay? All parts of that are welcome and useful, and we want to have it involved. We really, really expect the research in here to be, like I said, I think it should be transdisciplinary, but at least multidisciplinary. So uh, all of the student fellows in this will be working with multiple people from multiple disciplines. Uh, we also expect it to be connected to practical problems and policy challenges, and we're already in conversations with, with various policymakers in DC, as well as policy portions of companies like Facebook and so on to talk about what, how we could be involved. Okay. <clears throat> Some of this is based on various principles, such as that social cyber security research should be highly relevant, like so, you know, highly socially relevant. So this is not just, you know, something I dreamed up in an ivory tower. This is actually doing stuff that matters, and it has to be grounded in the best science. It's also that it's multi-level. There's things you have to do at the individual level and at the group level. You have to look at narratives and you have to look at social relations among people. As I said, you have to change both at once or you don't have an impact. We also look at uh, so these social events as kind of um, human-caused disasters. And the importance of that means that they may not occur every two seconds, but you have to be ready for them and you have to, you're always training on the next one. They're never identical to the previous things. So a lot of, so in other words, for those of you who love machine learning, machine learning alone is not going to solve this. Um, we also look at this from a resilience perspective with the recognition that resilience requires open and inclusive debate and in this kind of secure information environment. So how can we make that happen? These are the areas we're primarily focusing on, again, social cyber forensics. We're also looking at information threats and challenges, intent identification, indicators and warnings that something is happening to your group, inoculation and countering. So if you have ideas in this area, terrific. Come talk, come be part of this.
Uh, basically, the new center is, like I said, it's across multiple colleges. The three primary colleges who started off were Computer Science, Dietrich, and uh, CIT. And it's, uh, and it's also relying on a bunch of the work that's being done in Scilab and in Quesos. Okay, but it's a separate entity from all of those, but it kind of builds off of the research and the work and all of them. Myself, uh, David Danks, and Dick Sicker are the leads on this. Okay, so please talk to any of us more about it. In terms of community building, we will have an Ideas Summer Institute. The first one will be in summer of 2020. This is like the case of Summer Institute, but it's in the disinformation space. For those of you who know about the case, this one, week-long training in all the latest and greatest understanding that we can figure out about uh, disinformation, misinformation, um, and how to counter it. The other one is we're planning an annual conference. It will be held at Carnegie Mellon each year. And then uh, we also have a community website that is already up and running. The ideas website will point to it, but it's not up quite yet. Um, and we are also trying to foster new research. For that, we're going to be providing seed funding for uh, projects. These are, think of these as a semester or a summer. Uh, for to get kind of new idea, new projects off the ground and running, or to maybe add an extra chapter to a thesis that is more, you know, building from a different discipline or something like that. Uh, we're also looking at, at developing this challenge problem in the disinformation space, and we'll be working with the folks from SPP Brims, which is a DC-based conference every year, in defining what the disinformation challenge is, and then posting that out so people can go and you know, to work on it. These are data challenges. For those of you who have never been to a data challenge problem, these are where people give you data and they say go off and do something great with it. So we'll have ones in this area. Uh, we also are looking at trying to try to make sense of all the education and stuff that's going on on campus. It turns out there's a lot of stuff on campus going on, but it's not coordinated, it's not leveraging each other. So one of our big missions is finding it all and getting it all or get, you know, kind of coordinated so that uh, someone can go say, gee, I think I'd like to take three or four courses in this space. Okay, well, here's where, here's where they're being offered, for example. Um, so we're doing a variety of things. One of the things we're putting together is a committee to go through and look at all the curricula, undergraduate, master's, PhD level, find all the related courses. If any of you would like to be on that committee, let me know. Uh, and we'll basically be putting that together and deciding how much is there and seeing what we're missing. So that as new courses are developed, we'll know kind of where they're needed. <coughs> We're also, like I said, leveraging some of the ongoing data, ongoing things. Uh, these, we have various social media data sets already. If you're interested, you should talk to me. We have lots of social media tools. New stuff is coming in. We just got access to uh, CrowdTangler from Facebook, um, which uh, we just got access to that for the center. Um, we have access, there's a lot of university library databases and they're getting more all the time in this area that I've been talking with those, I'm on those. We also have the Social Cybersecurity Working Group, uh, which hosts not only a variety of meetings, but it also hosts tele, uh, telecon things. So did uh, online only uh, talks every month, and those will continue, and they're also be advertised. And of course, there's the digital storytelling seminar series over um, in Heinz. So we expect to be a clearinghouse in part. We're also expecting to link together all the different centers and to coordinate them uh, and to build new generation of researchers and have, we're hoping to build a new CMU educational track in this space as well for all the different kind of courses and so on. So near term, we're expecting to have a DC outreach. Um, my, I would love to have it next month, but I don't think that's going to happen. But uh, basically, this is one day where a bunch of us go to DC and we do something for the policymakers in DC about the space, you know, covering you know the gamut as much as we can. Uh, as I said, the ideas training seminar will be the summer. If you think you know of something that should be in either of these, let us know so that we can, you know, because we want to be very inclusive and. Just because I might say, oh, I know this deep fakes and this thing. I might know not, not know what you're thinking. So I'd like, so please bring that in. 
conference planning, we're, we're already starting to plan the conference. Right now it's being planned for a three-day three -day conference. Sometime in the spring, we're still negotiating to find space. Uh, we'll also have a kickoff event. And don't ask me when, because the date I had just got killed. But sometime we'll have this seminar series, which is great. And this will be occurring uh, like every other week. Um, we also have a web page, Twitter, and Facebook account. We'll have the call for seed proposals, which will be going out in about a month and a half from now. And like I said, the education committee. But please volunteer for some of these. This is the Facebook, uh, the Twitter, and the uh, YouTube, pay, uh, YouTube account. All the videos will be posted to the YouTube account as well, so to the YouTube channel. So they'll be easy to find. Uh, we also have a CMU-only distribution list. This includes people at Carnegie Mellon who are interested in this area. We also have an external to CMU distribution list. This is just, this is basically, because there are some things that if you're not at CMU, you're really not going to care about. So, so we have the two, they have the two different distribution lists, and this is the website for social cybersecurity. So in a nutshell, that's what IDEAS is about. Do we have questions? Yes. Um, one question I have is about like authenticating users. Um, about what? But this about um, authenticating users. That mm -hmm. if you had like all your users on like Facebook authenticated, then maybe you could reduce some of this misinformation with the accountability. Um, but the counter argument is that it like reduces the freedom of the internet that you can. Um, right. You don't need to validate who you are. So like, how does that? Those two competing things so I don't have a good answer for you, first off. I will tell you that that is one of the issues that currently people are trying to have more policy debates in, where they bring in policymakers, um, academicians, and people from those companies to talk about. The, even if you wanted to authenticate all the users, it can be very difficult because of the new technologies for creating um, uh, deep, per deep persona. The persona, 